So again, hello everyone and welcome. Mo Sanga is here. Everyone on YouTube, let me welcome you as well. So we're going over this text, which is the Kunya Galpo, but a different translation, different kind of presentation. This part is called the teaching. The teaching has three phases. The spiritual heritage, which establishes, establishes this teaching as believable and trustworthy. The main subject matter, which arises from that transmission. And the proscription to preserve the teaching by not broadcasting it. <laughs> as we're broadcasting it to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, and I, I suppose I can comment on that. Um, our YouTube channel is relatively small. It's not composed of bots or bot followers. Um, hopefully it's not uh, a bunch of fair weather Zokchimpas, but People that are authentic about their liberation. Same with this group. Very authentic practitioners in here. So, in my opinion, even the Dzogchen subreddit, there's a self-protection there. Self-secret. It's, it's not being broadcasted to this wide audience like maybe television. This has a pretty... small relatively small group of people that it's going to but please don't think we're breaching any kind of samayas or rules by talking about this and broadcasting it okay so the spiritual heritage this is the first one of the three phases listen great being the history of the teaching is given because initial confidence arises from it. The historical unfolding of the teaching reveals three ways by which its meaning is transmitted. Through natural self-authentication, -authentic through the medium being the message and the form being the content, through literary composition. The meaning of this is as follows. One, out of the total field of experience, the non-localizable realm of genuine reality, it is a vast expansiveness free from all fabrications. The supreme ordering principle of the universe manifests, reflecting the deep structure of what is. In this realm, which is an immense palace, terraced with light, the uh, mind communicates by activating an indestructible cognitive responsiveness out of the ever-fresh awareness which is mind's own primordial state and that of the five Buddhas. I just want to let you know I'm changing him to mind rather than having that gender-specific and gender-binary. For me, in the Dharma, it kind of chops mind in half when we isolate it into a gender binary. So this process then proceeds into the dimension of the full richness of being, which communicates its message through its own medium. To Garab Dorje, in the material dimension, he spoke correctly and grammatically via language. Oh, he spoke via language, huh? <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, let me just also comment on the theme here of universal creativity as it's known here in Tibetan Tuji, the compassionate energy of your mind. Um, really, whether I'm sitting here speaking Dharma 
or you're reading a scripture or you're watching a YouTube video, uh, it's your own mind, the energy of your own mind that's teaching you Dharma and helping to liberate you. So it's very you know, interesting like that. We kind of, to be honest with you, in my opinion, there's a teaching in every moment, especially when we get distracted or we're preoccupied with our desires. We lose our cool and we get angry. We can actually see the fork in the road where rather than being desirous, here was an altruistic, perfect chance for you to just be happy. Uh, maybe I can use a very superficial example. Uh, let's say you have a choice to go visit your child or go to the bar. Well, you really want to drink, your head hurts, and da 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 da. So you go to the bar and the child's sad and you miss this wonderful magical time that you could have had. This is a kind of example, but I'm talking about this can happen in the most minute of circumstances that even just reaching for some food, you know, from another superficial example, reaching for some food and the dog is coming up to you wanting, maybe unrelated, okay, <laughs> but wanting a little attention. So you have that moment. You never know the dog could be done, gone tomorrow or something, right? So you, you spend that presence and then you go take a bite of your food or something. And the dog will probably still be there. <laughs> so three to the great master Manjushri Mitra, he non-dually communicated the dynamic meaning to the great master Sri Singha. He communicated the very secret heart of the matter to the miraculous translator Verachana. He communicated the great non-dual pristine awareness to the prince Yugra Ningpo. He communicated the effortless field of reality to Karo Kesan Lemin. Hmm. He communicated the unchanging ground to looks like Ragyao Wei Dungpo. Yahweh Dungpo. He communicated the sky simile to Shortuk. Okay, we're going to communicate uh, to the end of this paragraph because <laughs> it goes quite long with all the lineages. And I'm not sure why they use Wiley. Why can't they just write it in a normal Tibetan transliteration. I mean, how how are we supposed to read the names? I mean, I, I can if I sit there and I stutter through it, but um, I feel like they don't need to use the Wiley. That's a little silly. I know that that tells you how it's spelt and everything, but in this text, we're not after how it's spelt. We, we want to read it. So maybe some of you don't know what that means, but when Tibetan is transliterated into English, um, there's two versions. One is called the Wiley, which has a total, like you're seeing here, total weird writing, the little R's in front of it and all this stuff. And so that's there because it corresponds to the Tibetan alphabet. And some words may sound similar, but have different spelling and different meaning. Right. So, but then they have another where you can take it from Wiley to normal, normal <laughs> writing, which they decided to opt out on. Uh, maybe we'll read that lineage at some point. You can always go through it. It's always nice to know the lineages. But let's go to the main subject matter. That sounds nice. In the second phase, the actual teaching transmitted by the foraging lineage has three parts. The foundation, guru yoga, the real subject matter, setting forth the teaching, and how to integrate experiences after meditation. Yeah, so here the foundation, hold up. Here we can say the foundation is recognizing the nature of mind, 
Uriyoka is familiarizing with that mind because then it's your teacher. That's your main teacher. And that's who you should offer your body to and gifts to and all this. Yeah, it's really good to be grateful to the lamas that help you with liberation because that's kind of a priceless gift. But at the same time, don't undermine the true guru, which is awareness. Okay? So, Guru Yoga. And, and just to give you a, a contrasting um, frame of reference here, Guru Yoga can be done by uh, mantras and visualizations and things like that. Excuse me. I have a hair bothering me. <laughs> the benefits of having a mustache. So, yeah, the Guru Yoga can be performed in, in various ways, but ideally you'd be merging your mind with the teacher. And so that uh, clear light realization is, is what you can start to share just by kind of following the teacher. And it happens almost miraculously. You start to have these realizations. You don't even know how they came there. How, you know, some of your stuff, you know how it's happening, but other stuff, you're just like, whoa, all of a sudden I'm free. <laughs> so, The necessary foundation for recognizing for oneself the reality of pristine awareness, which is what mind is all about, is the phase of yogic meditation on the guru. Swiftly moving pristine awareness, free of all mentation, is like a precious jewel which comes from all spiritual friends. No objectifiable, excuse me, not objectifiable, not dependent on transformation, it naturally satisfies all wishes. And I'll be honest with you, I had my personal doubts about the great wish fulfilling gem as it, as awareness is known. Um, but I think things really start to come clear for us the more we release into this um, spacious ineffable mind. So that includes existential answers, uh, livelihood issues, all that uh, seems to start to work itself out. If we have patience too and a little trust during those rough days. <laughs> Remember you have your teachers, your Sangha are here with you and they care about you. Believe it or not, uh, there are a lot of people out there that just care about you, even if they barely know you. It's really a wonderful part of sentient beings. Even the dogs like it. If you came here, all of my dogs would care about you. They would like you. you know? So this is something we can cherish in one another. So while if analyzed, it doesn't exist, when you find yourself in that state, it really does arise. Concretely, it isn't apparent. Oh, I love that. Yet in its aspect of arising, it can be shown to all. Isn't that wonderful? Concretely, it isn't apparent. Isn't that true about our mind? We can't really find anything substantial to familiarize with. We're just kind of unfamiliarizing with confusion and the density of the cloud of thought preoccupation. When we get uh, lost in our thoughts, you know, you can slowly even during the meditation see how we, we do that. We go, we get taken away by thoughts. Um, I would encourage you just to start learning to walk in pure presence, learning to abide, sit, eat, whatever in pure presence familiarizing with that at first it's a little uncomfortable almost like you're i don't know um walking blindfolded uh, you don't really abandon all your thoughts and plans and actions and all this stuff but eventually the thoughts less and less and less and they only really come when you need them that's uh 
very open, clear feeling. So <laughs> if you're anything like me, you might even notice like you're an awareness holder now so you may have a whole day of peace and bliss and open clarity and compassion right but you the next day somebody might upset you or you might wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you think about that all day long and you kind of perpetuate this sadness or this uh unhappiness or discomfort this ease of whatever types. And so as awareness holder, it, it could get frustrating and it could get kind of like, oh man, come on. Because you, you know you're in that cycle. Uh, you're stuck again in your old friend, uh, depression or anxiety, whatever it may be. But you know it now. And if, as a Zogchenpa, you can trust that you know it, that this day will pass, and then you'll be right back to uh, you know, being free of those things. Okay, so concretely it isn't apparent. I really like that uh, right there, but it can be shown to all. Now notice it doesn't say here, uh, yet in its aspect of arising, it can be shown to those who have, uh, who have all the empowerments and, and transmissions. <laughs> Those who have passed the restrictive uh, barriers. No, it says to all. To all. I love that. The inclusivity. Now, I'm not saying that Dzogchen's easier, that just anybody can walk up to Dzogchen. I'm not saying that. But if you have a connection with Dzogchen, yes, go right in. Don't waste time. <laughs> Long Chimpa also saying that, okay? Long Chimpa actually said it's a waste of life force. If you have a connection with Zokchen, not to pursue it. So, uh, the precious treasury, the wise sage, who is free of bias towards self or other, teaches by means of selflessness and compassion, and is called that which accomplishes everything. Uh, I think we can skip the visualization in Guru Yoga. Uh, again, I encourage you to the real subject matter. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this book knows how I think, but I encourage you to, to continue with your visualization practices, mantra practices. All right. I don't want to discourage anybody from those things, but there are countless teachers, videos, you name it on, on visualizations and guru yoga. Uh, there are a few online Dzogchen teachers. That is their main approach in the Jigma Lingpa tradition. I'm pretty sure that's what they're doing. But here, uh, the guru is your awareness and the yoga is your familiarizing with that. Okay. And I'll be here for anything that I can. I'll try my best to always be a good spiritual friend to everybody here. So, the real subject matter. The real subject matter, the way the teaching is set forth, has four parts. Becoming certain through the perspective of the teaching. Number two, transcending limitations through accustomizing, uh, accustoming yourself. Huh, always new words to this perspective. Okay, so transcending limitations through accustomizing or accustoming yourself. So again, English was my third language, guys, so bear with me. <laughs> and I'm probably not that smart. So, <laughs> transcending limitations through accustoming yourself to this perspective. I think that's our second stage too, by the way, in this group where uh, we have familiarization. Right? And maybe number one here, becoming certain through the perspective of the teaching. I don't know. So number three, overcoming obstacles through the way you can uh, conduct your life. Number four, abandoning hope and fear, the result. Huh. That's a pretty short section. 
becoming certain through the perspective. By the way, this Kunya Galpo has many texts included in it, including the um, the Kaku of Awareness and a few others like the Buddha Gupta Nata text uh, are in the Kunya Galpo, which is kind of a, a composition of the 18 root Semdi Tantras of Dzogchen. Kunya Galpo kind of is a, uh, they compile all those texts together. So becoming certain has two parts. Certainty that what appears is the play of experience itself. Number two, determining that experience itself is open. The play of experience. All experiences and life forms cannot be proven to exist independently of their being a presence before your mind, just like a lucid dream. All right. All that is has me, universal creativity. All that is has me. So the Kunya Galpo. Uh, they use the word universal creativity here to, uh, we've heard it, sovereign mother, the all-creating king, but mind. So all that is has me, mind, pure and total presence at its root. How things appear is my being. How things arise is my manifestation. And I really like the Kunya Galpo for this one, one thing. It explicitly tells you that mind is the creator of everything, animate and inanimate. By the way, this text has been also confused with uh, um, all creating God. A, a theist kind of interpretation has been taken of this text because of these lines. That everything is me. I'm the creator. I'm the all creating king, all, all creating monarch, all this stuff. So you can kind of see that, well, maybe that's what happened to Christianity. People just mistook these types of um, dialogues and created an external God creator. Ah, created the God that's the creator. <laughs> and science kind of backs that up that this is a mind made thing, God and everything. So uh, this text has been confused like that. And, Kempo Dongyal is, has a video specifically saying this is talking about your mind, but also this text, if you translate it right, says that you're talking about your mind. So, how things appear is my being, how things arise is my manifestation. Sounds and words heard are my messages expressed in sounds and words. All the capacities, forms, and pristine awareness of the Buddhas, the bodies of sentient beings, their habituations, and so forth, all environments and their inhabitants, life forms, and experience are the primordial state of pure and total presence. Not realizing that everything is nothing other than the manifestation of one's mind is called samsara. Ooh, don't skip past that so fast. Wait a minute. That last line was a ringer. And see, some translations don't don't say it like that, so people get confused. But not, re not realizing that everything is nothing other than the manifestation of one's mind is called some song. We can literally access this right here, right now. I could sit here in pure presence and feel pretty good, pretty free, even if I'm sick as a dog, injured, whatever, at least I'm in the pure presence. But if I start getting stuck in thoughts, and maybe there's a certain type of heavy thought, now my body's following, I'm scrunching up, I don't even want to be in this meditation group anymore, I'll catch you guys later, I'm going to sleep, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's really like that. It's when you proliferate into thoughts that samsara persists. 
That's why I love Dzogchen texts. They can be so direct. But it's really that easy, everybody, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Sean's saying, oh, good, you showed me I can summon anxiety by changing view. Yeah, well, hopefully you can all also retreat out of anxiety, right? <laughs> but, yeah, we do summon it. Yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> we just invite it. Like, come on. I'm down to feel some anxiety for the next few hours. <laughs> so. Without understanding me, the creativity of the universe, but investigating the phenomenon that I manifest, you perceive everything dualistically due to your attachment and longing. Holy. Are you hearing this, Yeshi? I really like this translation, by the way. For the most part, it gets pretty much a 9 out of 10 so far. Everybody, I don't know if you know this, I've been saying that the main fallacy in science, for example, and many other fields of study, is because we're investigating phenomenon, thinking that it's outside of our mind. Yeah, big time starting point is wrong, you see? If I'm going to study phenomenon without knowing my own mind, are you all seeing the fallacy here? The problem? So we can't even rely on science because now it's starting to lean into it because they pretty much have been forced into giving the mind credit for immense um, part of reality, including when these, you know, the split theory and a uh, split experiment and all this stuff where the particles are behaving different based on our minds our perceptions and stuff so these are relative i don't know to me that's a big point so we have two choices here science that's studying everything as if it, it wasn't even part of our mind or yourself where you can rest in ineffability you can rest in your own mind and allow things to be revealed to you. And you, you may not have all the vocabulary to describe that or summarize that. So we have to leave a lot of magic alone. But to me, that's right there, that right there um, tells you the main problem with many studies, actually, including Buddha Dharma. We approach it like it's external to us. So I'm sorry, I got a little excited there. So you perceive everything dualistically due to your attachment and longing. Impermanent, apparitional things will fade away. They are aimless like a blind man. Accustom yourself to this non-dual reality. For the duality of mind and that which appears before mind are like a dream. All that is experienced in your own mind are the unique primary reality. They cannot be conceptualized according to the cause and effect systems of thought. Investigate your mind's real nature so that your pure and total presence will actually shine forth. The concrete states of matter, solids, liquids, and so forth should be examined in this way remaining for 10 days where no otherness can be found, you will realize that not even an atom's worth of anything exists that is separate from pure and total presence. Realizing that, you will certainly be free from all fabricated obsession with the otherness of objects. Moreover, the very being of what is experienced externally and being an essenceless open dimension is shown to be the state of pure and total presence. In being the variety of unceasing experience, it is shown to be the play of pure and total presence. And so all reality is kind of the play of your mind. <clears throat> In being the variety, yeah, yeah. 
this is not the same as claiming that whatever you experience is mental because what you experience is not a mental event but arises as the play of the state of pure and total presence. That claim does not distinguish between mind and the state of pure and total presence. The state of pure and total presence is the clear light, the pure fact of awareness, non-conceptual, ever fresh awareness, whereas mind is the motivating factor of samsara, uh, it probably means conditioned mind, is the motivating factor of samsara, pervasive conceptualization. As the two truths says, mind and mental events are concepts, mere postulations within the three realms of samsara. Interesting how they're just using mind now in both ways. Uh, probably causes a lot of confusion with that one. So, whenever the state of pure and total presence is recognized, mind and mental events cease. Mind is objectification. Pure and total presence does not objectify. So here they're calling unconditioned mind pure and total presence. But they just said <laughs> everything is the play of mind, which is pure and total presence. So they really did a cha pulled a change up there on us. Uh, it might drop a point eight out of ten for this text off that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's move forward. So, therefore, even the subject which is held to be mental is also seen to be the originally pure state of being. All right, we can end there. So, next section will be experiences open dimension. Uh, can you scroll? Oh, no. oh, never mind. Okay. I just wanted to know the title of the next section. Experience is open dimensional. Okay, sweet. All right, thank you so much everybody for hanging out with me for that reading. I'm enjoying going through this text and I hope you are too.